In this second part of our lecture, we're going to be looking at sexual deviance and alternative sexualities in Victorian America. And some of these things that we're going to be talking about, like the use of birth control, really wouldn't be considered deviant or alternative in modern America. But we have to keep in mind that they had a much different understanding of sexuality and different sort of sexual norms and mores at this point. They also had nowhere near the same amount of medical knowledge that we have today about women's bodies and even about men's bodies or about the role of birth control and how that that might impact a woman's body. So as we discussed before, by the time we get to about the 1850s, that stereotype of women being like Eve and naturally lustful and Jezebels is gone. And really, women know very little about sex upon marriage. Some women knew almost nothing about the functions of their own body. And when they first began their menstrual cycle, they were terrified that they might be dying. Uh, the other thing that we talked about is how the Second Great Awakening leads to this increased usage of birth control because more and more women are attempting to seize that prerogative to change their destiny. Now, use of birth control would have been considered unacceptable by polite or middle class standards and also by conservative politicians and reformers. Yet we know from the historical documents that it's no longer just being used by prostitutes and also from the number of pregnancies that result and as the number uh, the family size begins to decline we see that birth control is being more and more uh, used by average men and women. And we also see that the use of abortion as a means of controlling the population skyrockets in the early 19th century. And in fact, the rates in the 19th century are fairly comparable to the rates that we have today. And I can't stress enough that this means that there has been a transition from the colonial era in which love uh, really had very little to do with sexuality in which sex was associated with reproduction into the 19th century when sex is now associated with love and intimacy instead of reproduction. Now many of the same methods of reproductive control that were used in the colonial era are also going to be used in the Victorian era and there will be a couple of new additions. So the first and always the soundest method of reproductive control is abstinence. Uh, also we see the rhythm method which is it was used in the colonial era as well and it's still used by many people today especially um, the Catholic Church really uh, says that the rhythm method is their preferred method of birth control and this is essentially when a woman abstains from having intercourse with her husband or her partner uh, whenever she is in her most, most fertile uh, or most likely to be ovulating days of the month and then they can have intercourse on the days when she's not ovulating. Uh, the problem with the rhythm method is actually that the rhythm method could be more effective than using other forms of birth control, even condoms. However, uh, the number is somewhere above 95% of people don't use it correctly, which causes issues. And actually, one of the modern inventions that people are just beginning to use, uh, you could look it up. It's called DAISY, D-A-Y-S-Y is essentially a fertility monitor where every morning you get up and you put this monitor under your tongue and you also confirm the days that you are menstruating if you're a woman and it tells you whether or not you are most fertile or least fertile and then the rhythm method can be used more effectively today than it was in the 19th century. Now other methods of reproductive control included coitus interruptus, which is essentially the withdrawal method, uh, the use of pessaries, and you see one in the upper right hand corner as well as some in the bottom right hand corner that would have just like the cervical caps uh, been able to protect the diaphragm and the cervix so that no sperm was able to reach the cervix. Uh, the use of postcoital vaginal douching, which is a terrible thing that you should not use ever for reproductive control because it will simply push the semen further up into a woman's vagina closer to her cervix. And then also the use of a rubber condom. If you remember back in the colonial era, we talked about condoms that were made from the guts of sheep. 
And once in the uh, 1830s we begin to have vulcanized rubber, they're able to make a new kind of condom. The problem with this is that although it's reusable, it's this incredibly thick kind of rubber consistency which would have dulled sensation quite a bit. And also you can't really tell from this picture here, but the condom would only have been long enough to cover the glands of um, your genitals, which means that it certainly wouldn't have protected someone from STDs, and it would have had to be incredibly tight to keep from slipping off. So most of these forms of birth control are still not perfected and can cause infections and all kinds of problems, especially the usage of a lemon wedge uh, to act as a pessary. And then the last form that we'll have is abortion, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Beginning around 1830, a great deal of literature about birth control began floating around the country. Robert Dale Owen's well-read Moral Physiology recommended that couples engage in coitus interruptus, or the withdrawal method. And then the Fruits of Philosophy, which was written by Dr. Charles Knowlton, urged women to douche and to wash their private parts right after intercourse with water and a spermicide such as alcohol or vinegar. And Dr. Knowlton believed that he had invented this technique and then went on to sue other birth control advocates for copyright infringement. But we know that early American recipe books already contained directions for making these preventative lotions, and they usually included a mixture of bichloride of mercury, milk of almonds, and rose water, and they were deemed infallible if they were used in the proper amount of time. Thanks to an increasingly efficient mail system, Americans could send away for birth control pamphlets, medical devices like diaphragms and syringes, condoms, spermicides for douching, and pills that promised to induce abortions. Ads for condoms, cures for venereal disease, aphrodisiacs, and abortion services were an economic mainstay of the urban newspapers. Agents distributed ads for birth control devices on street corners and mailed them to newlyweds. French was a code word for a contraceptive, and Portuguese for something that induced abortion. One New York firm advertised 201 styles of douching syringes, national syringes, unveiled a model with changeable nozzles that could be used for both birth control and watering houseplants. Diaphragms, called pessaries or womb veils, were also popular and easy to obtain. They were used to correct problems with the uterus as well as for birth control, and some women never took them out. There are records of people keeping them in for 30 or 40 years. Dozens, perhaps hundreds, of itinerant lecturers specialized in sexual topics, giving anatomy lessons, recipes for marital happiness, and explaining about birth control. Frederick Hollick, one of the best known, exhibited life-size paper mache models of the human body. The conviction that they are natural is at first so strong that many have even fainted away at first view from the impression that they were viewing a live body, he bragged. Hollick gave lectures on female anatomy and women's diseases to women-only audiences, but he discussed reproductive control in front of mixed groups. His ad in Boston in 1849 announced a new series of lectures for married persons who will readily understand the nature of the topics to be introduced and will see their importance especially to them. The want of such information at a timely period is the cause of incalculable suffering and unhappiness. Availability of information was much less of a problem than the accuracy of that information. Merchants frequently made up these wild claims for pills and potions that were nothing more than alcohol and flavored water, and there was really no way for a young couple to tell which advertisements were reliable. Advocates of the rhythm method offered completely different estimates on what part of a woman's cycle was the safest, with some recommending what was actually the period of maximum fertility. Lester and Lizzie Ward, who married right before the Civil War, documented much of their early marriage in their diaries, and they wanted to continue their educations and remain childless early on. Over the first few years of their marriage, her diary recounts one abortion, a rejection of mail-order contraceptive pills, the use of an instrument that failed, and then the purchase of a fine syringe with India rubber tube. The wards seem to have run the gamut of options, and yet in just a short span of a couple of years, Lizzie became pregnant at least twice. 
Like Lizzie Ward, many women resorted to abortion when other methods of birth control failed. Even doctors who didn't usually perform abortions reported that they were routinely asked to do so by their patients, and midwives hung flags in their windows to signal that they provided abortion services. Although far from socially acceptable, abortions performed early in a pregnancy were usually regarded as a form of contraception. The way in which people learned about abortion varied, so Native Americans and black healers and midwives were usually the ones who would have taught others about how to help a woman abort, and they would have done so through oral tradition as well as through printed home manuals on the part of the midwives. There were a lot of really crazy and impractical methods that were used by women at home to attempt to abort. Um, and these could be anything from drinking a tea of rusty nail water, to drinking turpentine, to jumping repeatedly in the hopes of dislodging the fetus, uh, to douching, to hot baths, or rubbing a potion or mixture of gunpowder on their breasts in the West. Um, and it could go all the way up to the use of bleeding from the foot in the hope that bleeding would balance the humors again, or to actually using a surgical probe to complete a do-it-yourself abortion. In order to perform these abortions, doctors and backstreet abortionists and especially very desperate pregnant women who were at home used whatever was available to them that would work. So they would usually insert a probe or a stick into a woman's uterus in an attempt to break the membrane and to dislodge the fetus or to irritate the uterine lining so it would basically shed or expel the fetus. And there are a lot of things they could have used in the 19th century, anything ranging from knitting needles uh, to once we have wire clothes hangers, urinary catheters, as long as it was long enough to reach into the uterus it could be used. In 1861, one doctor acknowledged having aborted 300 fetuses, and each one of those operations cost between 10 to $11. And while this was generally something that polite society would have frowned upon, these doctors certainly could have made a killing uh, simply performing abortions. The bigger issue here is that many of them were backstreet abortionists, and they didn't clean their utensils, and they didn't necessarily have medically safe or sound practices. And even those who were actual doctors, before the advent of the American Medical Association, they didn't take a Hippocratic Oath. All they essentially did was pay a fine in order to get their license, and some of them didn't necessarily have all of the medical training they needed to be able to hang up that shingle outside that said MD. In 19th century newspapers, for just $8, women could buy a long hooked silver probe that they might use for a self-abortion, and this probe would come with instructions. They might also use various other things they had around the house, most popularly knitting needles and these hairpins. Now, this is incredibly risky, though, because if they were to puncture their vaginal wall, they could die of an infection. There's actually a very good representation of this in the film Revolutionary Road with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio, as well as in the book that that film is based off of. One of the most controversial types of abortion in the 19th century was known as an embryotomy, and it was usually performed only in very severe cases when a woman's life was threatened due to delivery complications, or when the fetus was already dead inside of the woman's womb. And an embryotomy involved dismembering the fetus while it was still in the womb. And there are records of this type of surgery being practiced all the way back in the first century with the Romans. And it's also been found in England in the fourth century and in the Aztec Empire from the 14th through the 16th centuries. Uh, and it's believed that it was important enough to save the woman's life over the babies in most of these places in which they were willing to practice an embryotomy. Now, the practice was widely used in many countries to help remove this dead fetus from a woman's womb until the late 19th century when gynecological advances improved and doctors invented the cesarean section to replace this. <laughs> 
Abortions really found a growing commercial market due to the spread of both the patent medicine industry in the 19th century, as well as the increasing number of advertisements they could take out in newspapers. And by the 1860s, there were over 25 different chemical abortifacients in newspaper ads, postal circulars, and pharmacies, and they ranged in price from $1 to $10, which meant that a variety of people of different classes, as well as racial backgrounds, would be able to afford these methods. When we look at the statistics of how many women aborted in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, from 1800 to 1830, Historians believe that one out of every 25 or one out of every 30 lives births was actually aborted. Then if we fast forward to the time period between 1830 and 1850, these abortions per every live birth increased to one in every five or one in every six. And the women who were most likely to seek an abortion were actually white women who lived in the North. This includes both working class women and middle class women. The kind of drama that we often see play out amongst working class women would be one of a young, unmarried working woman who might be a domestic servant who was either seduced or sexually assaulted by her employer and then sought an abortion in order to terminate that pregnancy. And then within the middle class, typically they wanted to limit their family size because too many children meant that they probably wouldn't be able to maintain this middle class status because children are nothing if not expensive. Now, where we don't see very many abortions are, first of all, among the slave community because they really don't have any stigma attached to having babies born out of wedlock. And then abortion is extremely condemned in the South, very strongly so, until the years of the Civil War, where it becomes a little bit more prominent. A report issued by the Michigan Board of Health in 1878 estimated that one-third of all pregnancies in that state ended in abortion and that 70 to 80 percent were secured by prosperous and otherwise respectable married women. Now, if you're interested in comparing the statistics on abortion in the 19th century to more contemporary statistics, we can take some of the information from the Guttmacher Institute, and it's listed here. Half of pregnancies among American women are unintended, and 4 in 10 of those are terminated by abortion. 21% of all pregnancies, excluding miscarriages, end in abortion. And 18% of U.S. women obtaining abortion are teenagers. Those aged 15 to 17 obtain 6% of all abortions. 18 to 19 obtain 11%. And teenagers younger than 15 obtain about 0.4% of the abortions. Women in their 20s actually account for more than half of all abortions. Women aged 20 to 24 obtain 33% of all abortions, and women aged 25 to 29 obtain 24%. If we look at the racial breakdown, non-Hispanic white women account for 36% of abortions, non-Hispanic black women for 30%, and Hispanic women for 25% while women of other races are just 9%. If we look at the religious breakdown, 37% of women obtaining abortions identify as Protestant, and 28% identify as Catholic. Women who have never married and are not cohabitating account for 45% of all abortions. About 61% of abortions are obtained by women who have one or more children and 42% of women obtaining abortions have incomes below 100% of the federal poverty level. So you're more likely to have an abortion if you are under that poverty level. And then 27% of women obtaining abortions have incomes between 100 and 199% of the federal poverty level. All of this usage of birth control and abortion means that there's a very big decline in family size in the 19th century, and as these families get smaller, they become more emotionally intense than those of the colonial period, and parenting really changes from that very authoritarian and disciplinarian form of parenting in the colonial era to one that's much more loving and understanding in the Victorian. So at the beginning of the 19th century, American families had on average about seven children, 
By 1850, they had five or six children, and by 1900, they had only three or four children. So the decline in family size is really most pronounced among the native-born whites who live in the cities in the Northeast, and these are the locations where children are much more of an expense than an asset, whereas if you're living in the South on a farm or a plantation, you want lots of children to help as farmhands or to help around the house. Because of the widespread use of contraception and abortion, and also the rampant spread of prostitution, there were many Americans in the 1870s who were really alarmed by declining birth rates and by what they saw as the movement of sexuality away from reproduction and even outside of marriage. And so many of these conservative members of society began to push back against this increasing radicalization and liberalization liberalization of sexuality. And probably the most important way in which this impacts American history is through the Comstock Law, which was in, which was in place between 1873 and 1965. And Anthony Comstock was a senator who helped to push this law through Congress, and it basically outlawed any circulation of contraceptive information or devices that could be used for contraception through the mail on the grounds that they were immoral. And despite the fact that the Comstock Law was passed, Americans continued to learn about contraception through medical journals and physicians and pharmacists and friends and family, and the ads in newspapers became increasingly veiled. They would just use code words rather than speak openly about birth control. I think it's really important to remember that prior to the mid-19th century, abortion was legal in the United States, and it wasn't condemned as long as it was done within the first couple of months of a woman's pregnancy. And that was during right before the time period known as quickening. And according to the doctrine of quickening, life begins when a woman feels the fetus move within her. That's what quickening is, the feeling of the fetus beginning to move. And that as long as you got your abortion prior to that, which was usually around three months of time, then it would be okay. The problem with this, of course, is that nobody knew whether or not that fetus was moving unless the mother admitted to it. And so the laws in this time period were really meant to protect women from being pushed into an unwanted abortion rather than to actually prosecute those women. This really begins to change in the 1860s, and throughout that second half of the 19th century, we begin to see 40 different states enacting anti-abortion statutes. They very quickly begin to reject the quickening doctrine, and they say that life begins upon conception. They place limitations on any kinds of advertisements for abortion, and they also transfer the legal authority for abortion from women to doctors. And there were a couple of unintended consequences that came as a, resort, as a result of making abortion illegal. The first is that it raised the price of abortion because many abortionists went underground and became backstreet abortionists. And to get something that was against the law, a procedure that could have landed them in prison, certainly would have cost you more. The other thing it did was it put abortions into the hands of the least reputable medical practitioners. And so it made abortions much more dangerous and deadly. Now our next type of sexual deviance or unusual relationship would be same-sex relationships in the 19th century. And if we look at the evolution of the concept of homosexual identity, we can compare three different time periods. We've already discussed the concept of it in colonial America, where they really didn't have any concept of sexual identity. And so if one was caught in a sodomitical act, they were punished with a fine, they were whipped sometimes, they might be branded, but very rarely would they experience capital punishment. Most often, if they accepted their punishment and they apologized, they were welcomed back into the community, and there was no, no mention made about a sexual identity. Their one sexual act did not define who they were as a person. By the time we get into the early 19th century, they still condemn sodomy, which is any non-procreative sex act, but they're condemning it on the basis of legal concerns rather than religious ones.
And after the American Revolution, they began to refer to it as a crime against nature, which would imply that sodomy is offending the natural order rather than God. And it's not until the mid to late 19th century that we even have the advent of the word homosexual, which comes actually from a German social worker. And it's at this point that doctors start to use a medical language to refer to sodomy and homosexuality, and they look at it as both a disease or, and or a mental condition. And it's labeled at this point congenital inversion and perversion. And many doctors believe that people are born with this congenital inversion and that they can be cured of it. When we look at the increase of same-sex relationships in the 19th century, there's really a couple of different things that we can point to as the reason for this. And the first would be the growth of cities. As more and more young people move from the farms into towns and cities, we find that these provide a sense of anonymity and that these people, often young men, have wages to spend on their sexual pleasures and there's an abundance of people there for them to meet. Urban boarding houses especially allowed young men to solicit one another. And Walt Whitman, the famous poet, uh, himself called Manhattan a city of orgies and daily delights. And he wrote very often in his journals about soliciting other men to bring back to his boarding house. The other thing that really leads to an increase in same-sex relationships is the Civil War, as soldiers and male nurses form deep attachments. And we know again that Walt Whitman actually served as a nurse during the Civil War, and he wrote very often of how attached he would get to his patients, and how he would kiss them in longing, and how he would really miss them uh, when they eventually left the hospital. We also see that during the Civil War, the accounts for flogging of homosexual activity actually increase, and this is probably because of the fact that soldiers could purchase male prostitutes just as easily as female prostitutes in the form of what were known as camp followers. The rise of the prison system in the 19th century also led to this increase in same-sex relationships. And we see at this point that there's actually a division between male and females for the first time within this prison system. And you begin to see very often someone who's been in the system for longer looking out for someone who is a first-time uh, offender or who is going into the prison system for the first time. And then the last thing is that as the West begins to open up, we begin to see these very temporary sexual unions forming between men in the West. And there's a lot of cowboy lure that is surrounding these long-term attachments. And in fact, there's one lyric from a song that from the 19th century that really springs to mind. And the section of it goes, young cowboys had a great fear that old studs once filled with fear completely addle, they'd throw on a saddle and ride them on the rear. It's during the 19th century that we also see a rise in the rates of female passing, which is when one member of a working class female couple adopted the identity of a man. And it makes sense that this would be done considering the fact that it was incredibly difficult for a woman to get a decent wage working outside of the home. So if one part of the couple was able to pass themselves off as a man, then they might be able to both fit into society and also earn a living wage. And there are stories of women passing that appear in newspapers throughout the country, especially in western states. And you see one example here, uh, and it wasn't that uncommon to find stories of women fighting during the Civil War, just like Frances Clayton did, and she served in the Missouri Artillery and Cavalry Units. And oftentimes these women would fight, and they uh, would fight with great honor and distinction, and they wouldn't be found out to be women until they were injured and brought into the doctor's tent, or if they became pregnant, for example. One of the most famous examples of passing would have to be Albert D.J. Cashier, who was born Jeannie Irene Hodgers, but lived as a man and served in the Union Army during the Civil War. And he lived his entire adult life as a man, despite having the biological sex of a woman. Although several doctors over the years discovered his secret, they kept quiet. 
But finally, when he was an old man in 1913, his family put him into a state hospital, and it was discovered that Albert was actually a female, and the attendants actually forced him to wear a dress from then on. When Albert was buried after he passed away, he was buried in full uniform, and the tombstone was engraved with the name Albert D.J. Cashier, rather than Jeannie Irene Hodgers. For middle and upper class women, the cult of friendship encouraged close same-sex friendships, and female friendship could really rival marital relationships. As women became friends as young girls, and their friendships continued on into their adult years, and these relationships were just as intense uh, as those of the relationship between a husband and wife, and it was very normal for physical intimacy to take place between female friends. And throughout the early 19th century, physical intimacy and close female friendship was certainly considered normal within the advice books, and these books accepted girls holding hands, kissing, and caressing as long as they did it privately. So, for example, we have letters written between the very famous poet Emily Dickinson and her sister-in-law Susan Gilbert, whom she appeared to be in love with, and I will upload some of those letters to Blackboard so that you can look over them yourself. Women began to increasingly attend college, especially middle and upper class women, in the 1860s and 70s. And as they did, they formed romantic relationships that paralleled courtship at these all-women colleges. And this process was known as smashing. They would exchange tokens of affection like candies and necklaces and flowers, rings and lockets of hair. And amongst these women who went to college, they might also enter into what was known as a Boston marriage. And this was a relationship in which two women lived with one another, vacationed with one another, and went to one another's family's homes on the holidays. And they may have had a sexual nature to the relationship, although that wasn't always the case. But it certainly made sense for women who were increasingly entering into this educational world and were afraid that once they left and graduated that they would be married and no longer have the ability to use this information that they had gained. And so rather than going into a traditional relationship, they chose to stay in a relationship with another woman. In contrast, the writers of the middle and upper class transcendentalist movement formulated their own ideals of romantic friendship in which two kindred spirits develop deep and lasting attachments. And this transcendentalist movement was a group of artists and writers and political thinkers who protested the general state of culture and society and emphasized the divine in nature, the value of individual intuition, and a belief in a spirituality that might transcend one's own sensory experience to provide a more useful guide in daily living than is possible from logic and empirical reasoning. Ralph Waldo Emerson was the father of the Transcendentalist movement, and he wrote an essay on friendship which idealized romantic male friendships. He said, It is one of the blessings of old friends that you can afford to be stupid with them. And he said, I didn't find my friends, the good Lord gave them to me. And then lastly, he also wrote, the glory of friendship is not in the outstretched hand, nor the kindly smile, nor the joy of companionship. It's in the spiritual inspiration that comes to one when he discovers that someone else believes in him and is willing to trust him. Two of the other very famous writers of the Transcendentalist movement were Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, the author of The House of Seven Gables, as well as uh, The Scarlet Letter. And if you've ever read Moby Dick, you know that there are some homoerotic themes that are explored within this piece of literature. And if you look at the dedication page, it's dedicated to Melville's bosom friend, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And while we certainly can't say with any certainty that Melville, Hawthorne, or Emerson were engaged in same-sex intimate relations, they clearly had extremely close same-sex friendships that were considered innocent within the standards of the 19th century and might seem maybe strangely close to some people today.
Now, the last really important male figure that historians are always speculating about was President Abraham Lincoln. And you've probably seen some of this controversy before as historians debate whether or not he was homosexual or heterosexual. And we know that he was married to a woman, to Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, and yet many historians believe that based upon the writing of Lincoln that he didn't have a lot of interest in women, including that of his wife, and that he preferred the company of men. We know that as a young adult, he shared his bed with his friend Joshua Speed, and that in and of itself is not that unusual because he was living out on the frontier, and if there was a house with just one bed, it really wouldn't be unusual for two friends to share that bed, even for years at a time. But what was unusual is that he wrote these very tender and loving letters which lamented the fact that he had to get married when the time came, and he sent these letters to Joshua. The other thing that really has put some historians on alert is that later, when Lincoln is in the White House, he actually doesn't sleep in bed with his wife, which isn't that unusual because if you've ever been married, you know that sometimes husbands or wives snore and, you know, it can be very common to sleep in separate beds or even separate bedrooms. But what was unusual is that Lincoln actually slept almost every evening in bed with the captain of his bodyguards. And unlike on the frontier, here, there were hundreds of beds available in the White House, which has made many historians raise an eyebrow at this kind of behavior. By the time we get to the end of the 19th century, same-sex intimacy has been labeled as perverse, and this has stigmatized an entire range of relationships and driven them underground, as same-sex friendships really lost their innocence. In the 20th century, homosexuality became a mental disorder that was recognized by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and doctors believed that it was a pathological hidden fear of the opposite sex that was caused by traumatic parent-child relationships. And this belief really doesn't change until 1974, when psychologist Evelyn Hooker performs a study comparing happiness and the well-adjusted nature of gay men and heterosexual men, and she finds that there really is no difference between the two. And she's the one who successfully lobbies to have it removed as a mental disorder from this diagnostic and statistical manual. But it's worth noting that even in 1974 when this happens, there were many psychologists who were lobbying against Evelyn. The last thing that we're going to discuss is the explosion of prostitution in the 19th century. And the causes for this are often very similar to the causes for the growth of same-sex intimacy. You find the rise of cities brings about this working class urban district that will cater to the pleasure of young men. And also cities have these sort of transient, seedy, and mobile underclasses that escape detection of authorities. You also find industrialization and economic disruptions that displace women, and many of these women turn to domestic service, working as maids, and this was difficult, low-paying, and a dangerous job where women risked being sexually assaulted by their employer, and prostitution was actually the best-paying job for a woman at this time. The Civil War also caused many to turn to prostitution as women needed to feed their families in order to survive when their husbands and their fathers were gone or passed away, and you also had a market that was readily available in the Civil War soldiers. The opening of the West also skewed this sex ratio in the early years of the West. There were two women for every 100 men, and prostitution was the largest occupational category for women in the West. 20% of all women in California during the gold rush were actually prostitutes. And then we also see that there is this increased military presence in the West that causes a lot of camp followers who are oftentimes prostitutes to come, and they begin to establish what are known as hog farms. And these are rural brothels that service men in the military forts, usually operated by a married couple, and they house anywhere from three to 12 prostitutes on what looks like a farm, but is actually a brothel. And usually these prostitutes were white.
And then lastly, we see this need to maintain gender roles in class hierarchies, and middle and upper class men argue that they're protecting their innocent wives by unleashing their sexual aggression on a prostitute rather than upon their wife, who should only have sex a couple of times a year lest she actually damage her womb or her health. The way that prostitution worked in the 19th century is much different than it works today, as it was often actually empowering for women back then because they either operated independently or they lived in brothels that were run by a female madam who charged them rent. And if you compare that to the present day, it's really men who profit from prostitution because it's almost always men who are pimping out prostitutes and often they violently force these women into prostitution or into continuing their work as a prostitute and they take the majority of the money. But in the 19th century it was the prostitutes themselves and the female madams who were making most of that money. Now men did also uh, profit from prostitution in some ways. They were the landlords of brothels sometimes as the owners of saloons or theaters that had a um, staff that might be prostitutes. They might be police or politicians who receive payoffs in order to leave certain brothels alone. Uh, some women lived with or helped support what was known as a sporting man, who is very much like a modern day pimp that would have controlled her earnings. And the actual pimps in the 19th century would have been little boys who were working class boys. Oftentimes they were actually the sons or the family members of those prostitutes. And they sometimes worked as newsboys as well, but they would go around securing uh, men to come and visit the prostitute. And then throughout most of the 19th century, this is going to remain a female dominated profession. There are a lot of variations in the lives of prostitutes based upon their class and their race as well as their location. And if we start by looking at what was known as yellow sex trafficking, we'll find a form of prostitution specifically in the West as well as in California. And this is when women were taken from Asia, usually from China uh, or from Japan, and they were brought over to the West Coast in a system of sexual slavery. And oftentimes these women were hoping to join their husbands who were already in the United States working on the railroads in the West. And so they might sell themselves into indentured servitude without realizing that they were going to become sex slaves for a long period of time. Now, some of these women would have arrived in the U.S. and lived in brothels. Some would have lived in the homes of the men who purchased them. And others would have lived in what are known as human zoos, which were like the old-style lion cages that would have held women, and a customer would have come up and selected the woman that they wanted out of that zoo. And then they would have returned them once they had finished. So this importation of Chinese male laborers to work the railroads in the 1850s really caused this expansion of yellow sex trafficking as more and more of their female family members were kidnapped or came over with a promise of marriage or were sold into indentured servitude by their families. And this trafficking was often controlled by Chinese gangs that were known as Tongs and the entire system was underpinned by organized crime. Japanese women were often abducted by sailors and brothel owners in a method that was similar to the impressment of sailors. And we know that two-thirds of the 3,500 Chinese women in California were prostitutes in 1870, that 50 to 70 percent of all adult Chinese women in San Francisco were prostitutes, and that these women were forced to service both white and Asian men. Many of these Asian prostitutes were teenagers or children, and some were just babies when they entered into the trade. It would have cost about $100 to $200 to purchase a baby, whereas it would cost around $1,500 or more to purchase a female teenager. And they were kept in these cribs. You can see a picture of one located on the right-hand side here. And as you walk down the busy streets, you would find one crib after the other after the other, and you could see the face 
of the prostitute through the mesh or the wiring. And then these girls would often be forced to solicit the men as they passed by. And if a man chose to visit with them, the owner or the madam would come and unlock their pin, draw the curtains to let the girl service the customer and collect their money, and then the man would leave and she would be locked back into this crib, which she would almost never be allowed out of. The impact of this form of prostitution was obviously devastating. These girls would have suffered physical and mental abuse. They were starved, especially if they weren't able to find customers. They were the victims of various STDs, venereal diseases like syphilis and gonorrhea were especially common. And many of them were addicted to drugs as they were given drugs as a way to make them more complacent. And this was particularly true of opium in the 19th century. They had an average lifespan of just four years in the trade, so if they had been sold into indentured servitude, it was almost positive that they were going to die while they were still within this trade. By the time that these women reached the age of 20, they would have been considered useless hags. Many of them would have been missing their teeth by this point, rotted out from the drugs and from lack of hygiene. They would have looked tired and their skin would have looked very sallow at this point. And some of them also became fearful and lashed out and they were chained to their beds uh, and they were continuously given narcotics via needle in order to keep them from leaving. They had no free time outside of these cells very often or these cribs uh, and their entire life surrounded this particular trade. Uh, and when these women were of no further use, they were put into a small windowless cell and they were given a small bowl of rice and a candle and they were supposed to, in addition to this, take the knife that was given to them and they were meant to die by the time that the candle ran out one day later so that they wouldn't become a burden on the brothel owner. The other kind of brothels that existed were known as the respectable brothels and these were usually filled with white prostitutes. And in order to pick the right girl, men would have picked up a gentleman's directory, which was also called a blue book because they were these little blue books, which is sort of funny considering the fact that at most colleges when you take your exams you purchase a blue book to write in uh, and also Kelly's blue book is based off of these old 19th century blue book manuals for prostitutes but I suspect most people don't know the connection there uh, and so if you look inside of these blue books it basically lists each one of the brothels and all of the prostitutes that work for them and then it lists what they're known for and so some of them it would have their name and say that they were a nude dancer or that they were an african-american prostitute or if a house was a flagellation house or into uh, BDSM, it would be listed there. And the most controversial of all of these would be the child prostitutes because there was a tremendous fetish with virginity in the 19th century and really an obsession with it. And the younger that a, a girl could pass herself off as, the more likely she would be to make quite a bit of money. Now within these respectable brothels, there's a great deal of variation by class and the upper class clientele are going to go to brothels known as parlor houses and these would have been quite lovely. They would have had really nice plush carpeting and nice drapes and there would be plants indoors and large ornate mirrors and paintings and the women would have been dressed like ladies of 19th century high society and they would have spoken in a proper manner and been able to interest the men both intellectually as well as physically. These were considered the cream of the crop and they really scorned women who worked in the saloons and dance halls and in theaters and especially women who worked in cribs. They considered themselves to be better than these other prostitutes. Body houses or bordellos were more likely to cater to lower class clientele and they would have been supported by a madam to whom they would have paid rent every week. And this would have encompassed the vast majority of prostitutes in the United States. And when a man came in to find uh, a prostitute, he would have sat in the waiting room and he would have been entertained by a juggler or a dancer or a musician or a singer. 
and there would have been bouncers there to handle any men who got rough or unwieldy, and they would have sat and waited until it was their turn to visit with a prostitute. And when they went into the room, unlike in those parlor houses, this would certainly have been a bare-bones kind of room. There might have been a bed and a pallet, and a, a prostitute would have had one set of sheets, which meant after she... Uh, had intercourse with a caller, she would have had to hang her sheets out to dry for a moment. She would have had one chamber pot, a sponge, and a cleansing solution to keep from getting pregnant and to try and keep from getting a venereal disease. And if they were lucky, they might have a fireplace, but otherwise there was really no furniture. The two lowest rungs of this prostitution tier would have been crib houses and then street walkers. And girls in these crib houses would have operated independently. They wouldn't have had the backing of a madam. And they would have lived in these little segregated districts in little cabins or cribs. And this was a very small dwelling with a front bedroom and a kitchen in the rear. And they often would have used that front bedroom for their business. And they would have, if they had children, or were married, which was sometimes the case, that back, uh, that back kitchen would have been used to house their family. So in cities, the cribs were usually located on busy alleys where the men would wait on benches outside for their turn. And then this lowest class of prostitute was simply a street walker, and these were women who solicited men in the back alleyways and on the docks, and didn't necessarily have anywhere to take them other than to a shadowy corner. Outside of this system were concert saloons and dance halls, and men often went to concert saloons to eat and listen to music, to watch a fight, or to pay women for intercourse. And so these saloon girls would get up and sing, they would dance with men, they would flirt, and they would attempt to push beverages because these women would have earned $10 a week plus a drink commission for every drink they were able to sell to a man. In addition, if you were an entertainer, like a topless or a bottomless dancer, a belly dancer, a can-can dancer, or a gymnast or trapeze artist, you could have earned $50 a week as a soloist, which was really a coveted position. Amongst the dance halls, which were often called hurdy-gurdy houses, the dancing would begin at 8 o'clock at night, and it cost a dollar for admission, and the girls would initial your ticket for a dance, and you had to pay extra for each dance that you wanted. And these dances would last anywhere between 5 and 15 minutes, and you weren't supposed to pay too much attention to just one girl, because these establishments were losing too many people to marriage. Uh, and yet these popular girls who danced at the hurdy-gurdy house could have anywhere between 25 and 50 dances a night, which meant that they could make anywhere between 20 and $53 a night, which was incredible money for the Victorian era. When historians began to look at the types of women that were prostitutes, they discovered that they were usually foreign-born, and they were typically anywhere between the age of 9 and 25, which means at a very tender age, many young girls were entering into this trade because they didn't see any other option for survival. And the way that you would have identified a prostitute in the 19th century is they would have been highly visible on the streets in cities. They would have had on ankle length skirts that might have showed their ankles more than you would see uh, a lady showing. They would have worn very bright colored clothing and oftentimes that clothing wouldn't have been quite as intricate as that of a 19th century middle class woman uh, or upper class woman because it would have been very difficult to get in and out of their clothing quickly. They would have painted their faces with much brighter rouge on their cheeks and lipstick and also sometimes eyeshadow. And then the only ones who smoked cigarettes in the 19th century, the only women, were prostitutes until we find the craze of the 1920s with flappers. The women who became madams of their own brothels could earn fortune and fame, and they were wealthier than any other woman in the United States and among the wealthiest in the whole country. In the 19th century, because women controlled the sex trade, it was far less violent than it is today with men controlling the sex trade and the violence of pimping women. <laughs> 
One of the most famous madams was Diamond Jessie Heyman, and she began her career as a prostitute and worked her way up to a madam. She owned a three-story brothel in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco that had three fireplaces, a saloon, a champagne cellar, and 15 suites of imported furniture, which meant that this was a fairly sizable brothel and it was quite nice on the inside. She provided each one of her employees with a $6,000 wardrobe that included a fox fur coat, four tailored suits, eight hats, two dress coats, 12 pairs of gloves, 12 pairs of shoes, seven evening gowns, and seven negligees. She earned enough money in her business to buy several parcels of city land, and after the 1906 earthquake that destroyed a lot of San Francisco, she and other madams came together to provide food and clothing for thousands that had been left homeless. And when she died in 1923, she had an estate worth 116000 and she was called an angel by the local newspaper. The number of prostitutes in the 19th century really varied by the region in which we look at. And if we look at the North, we know that in 1850, Dr. William Sanger estimated that there were over 6,000 prostitutes, one for every 64 men in New York City. And then there were also smaller cities that had brothels. Between 1865 and 1883, 40 madams in St. Paul, Minnesota operated houses. San Francisco had a full range of establishments from dance halls to brothels and elegant parlor houses. And one estimate claimed that Chicago had over 500 brothels in 1860. The South urbanized much later than the North, so prostitution was seen here on a much smaller scale. And this was particularly the case because in the South, white men could seduce or rape slave women, and they really had much less of a need to purchase sex. But we know still that married and single men visited brothels in southern cities. And in 1858, the mayor of Savannah estimated his town had one prostitute for every 39 men, and Norfolk had one for every 26. We also know that the first experiment with legalized prostitution during the Civil War was actually in Nashville, Tennessee, rather than in a northern city. And we also know that most southern prostitutes were white. And while the idea of being Diamond Jesse Heyman might seem very glamorous, given how much money she had and the kind of wardrobe and house she lived in, there were a lot of risks that prostitutes took every day. There were physical risks in the form of becoming pregnant and having no way to support that child, uh, venereal disease, which could potentially kill you because at this point they have no real treatment for most diseases and they treat syphilis and gonorrhea with mercury, which is much more likely to make your teeth rot out and to make you salivate and eventually die than it is to actually treat the venereal disease. Uh, prostitutes often experienced violent deaths, and these deaths came from drug abuse and alcohol use and being beaten and being stabbed and raped. Uh, they had incredibly high rates of suicide, and they also were at risk for being harassed by police and also for local, from local men. There were many emotional risks that came with being a prostitute, and these included low self-esteem, depression, suicidal thoughts, and almost all prostitutes had some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. As the 19th century marches on, the Civil War is going to bring the legalization of prostitution, and this happens because of the fact that, first of all, troops keep going missing in the evening as they leave their camp and go visit the brothels, and also because the venereal disease rates are getting out of control. And so by legalizing prostitution, in most places, the government forces prostitutes to buy a license, and the money that they pay for that license, as well as a weekly fee, goes to paying for a doctor who checks in with the prostitutes once a week to ensure that they're healthy. And if they're not healthy, they have to go to a hospital made specifically for prostitutes, which is also paid for with those fees in order to get their venereal disease under check, uh, if it can be. And if not, they're no longer going to receive a license. And by doing this, the rates of venereal disease are decreased significantly, and it also makes the profession much safer for women.
Now, after the Civil War, you find that prostitution is no longer legalized in most areas. It's once again against the law, except in red light districts, which are created after the Civil War. And these are areas that are specifically for brothels. And you can only work as a prostitute inside of these brothels, away from the sight and the lives of respectable ladies. And the reason for this is really because prostitution and, and the availability of prostitutes has reinforced this sexual double standard and caused marital problems for middle class, average, and even wealthy American men and women. And so it's during this time period that women seize upon their moral prerogative and begin to join female moral reform societies in order to target prostitution and to see an end to prostitution and many of these other forms of sexual deviance or vice.